Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Don Golding. Don is a space avionics engineer who's developed a lot of really cool hardware that's gone into space. Don, welcome to the pod. Hey, I'm really happy to be here. Really happy to have you on. Um, so what is that behind you? I, uh, I feel like that's a good place to start. Uh, so <clears throat> um, I have 50 years experience in developing electronic uh, circuit boards, you know, circuits and that sort of thing. And um, I'm kind of tired of PCs and they're, um, you know, you have to wait for them. You know, these are supposed to be gigahertz printed, you know, um, personal computers and they run so slow. It, it's to me from a hardware perspective, you know, I'm designing my own computer. I'm designing my own custom processor using what's called a field um, programmable Gatorade or FPGA. So I'm, I'm wiping the computer science board clean and I'm starting with a whole new concept in computing. That's awesome. It's my little side project. This is a side project. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Full time. I, I, um, designed computers for like NASA missions. That's awesome. So what is the, I guess the one you designed your own, why don't we start there? Just cause I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear a little bit more about it. Um, so I call, I call it the core one. Um, it's, and core stands for CISC over risk engine. So you remember in the 1990s, um, everyone said, Hey, you know, let's reduce the instruction set. We used to have CISC complex instruction set. Um, that was a uh, big mainframes and stuff had complicated um, instructions. And then they decided to go with risk. Now that was like a MIPS um, thing. Yeah, that's reduced instruction set computer. Um, I'm actually going back to CISC. But and the reason uses why CISC too, is right? the hardware yeah. is so fast now. Um, you can push complex opcodes into silicon today. So, you know, we've we've been stuck in a Wintel jail <laughs> for for 30 years. <laughs> and it's time for something fresh and new. And that's what that's what the core one is all about. That's awesome. It's I'm just wiping the board clean, designing my own computer, my own microprocessor uh, with programmable opcodes. And um, it's going to be heavily uh, I'm designing it to run AI very efficiently. Yeah, I can imagine if you're you know talking about like SHA-256. So what are some of the things you've worked on on space? I feel like that's the real reason uh, we came here is to hear some cool space stories. <clears throat> so I, I started with um, Made in Space out in uh, Silicon Valley um, in late 2018. And um, Made in Space was doing a lot of work with, um, like they have a 3D printer up in the ISS space station. Oh, cool. Yeah, and they 3D print tools and things for the astronauts. So when I first came to uh, Made in Space, they, uh, the control board that ran the 3D printer was like six different boards. You know, they they loved Arduinos. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes. the first time I ever used an Arduino on a real project. That's um, wild. Arduinos are, are, are really not bad. They're great for people to get started with, but... You know, I was more familiar with, you know, having a C compiler and GCC and all this other stuff. Um, yeah, it's definitely but, the best of its kind. Like, I've seen a lot of those, you know, development boards, like with like the basic stamp, and then there were some PIC based ones, and a lot of attempts at doing what Arduino seems to have cracked. So it's it's good from that perspective. I agree. Yeah, Arduino is, is a very good way for people to start. So I don't, I don't want to belittle it. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, I've done a lot of professional stuff and uh, 
just hadn't seen an Arduino before. And I, I couldn't, you know, come up with a reason why you shouldn't. But um, so anyway, um, <clears throat> they wanted a single board computer that could replace all those six boards and then update because they were using um, a 16 bit uh, um, processor um, and they wanted to go up to the, the 32 bit. So I designed a 32 bit processor board and I'm an FPJ guy and they couldn't spell FPJs there. And <laughs> so I, I kept nudging them. I said, would you let me put an FPJ on the board? You know, I'll just put it on, on the side. It'll be a little coprocessor. And <laughs> we can do some IO magic and stuff. And he's okay. All right, Don. So pat me on the head said, go, go to your corner and go ahead and get, make the board. So I did. And I put an FPJ on there. <clears throat> so, um, that is, all the ISS uh, experiments that I'm aware of use that board from then on. It took me took me about six or eight months to design the board oh, cool. and then threw it over the wall. I was only electrical engineering. They didn't let me do any software. I was too busy. They gave me too many electrical engineering projects to work on. And then, um, <clears throat> and then they came up to me one day and said, uh, we just got a huge project, $74 million, Arconaut, Arconaut one project, where we're going to 3d print a uh, 10 meter beam in space. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's going to be, uh, I think it was a hundred millimeters on a side. Let's see, it was five inches. So what is that? You, you do the math. It's like <laughs> I guess that's probably 12. Change. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like 12 or something, 12 centimeters. but anyway, it's a, a lattice beam at 3d print it. And they told me to design the computer. I said, okay, great. I never designed a space computer before, but I, I worked for Panasonic avionics. I, I worked on commercial aircraft entertainment systems. When you watch, um, CNN or, you know, one of the live, uh, live TV on an aircraft, that was a, another computer I designed. Oh, cool. It was, is Panasonic Avionics has about an 80 or 90 percent market share in in flight entertainment. That's awesome. So, <clears throat> yeah, I worked on the team um, that did that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so I started, and I love, I absolutely love a new 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 challenge, new projects, especially if I don't know anything about them, and I and I have to go out and learn and become at least you know. Um, knowledgeable if not an expert during the project <laughs> that's awesome yeah i like that sort of thing as well so <clears throat> so i started digging into it and i'm i'm reading all this stuff on space and i'm talking about radiation and bit flipping bit flipping as single event uh upset that's a u um and all this stuff and um, radiation is such a harsh, and I mean, uh, space is such a harsh environment. There's radiation, there's little um, little atoms float, you know, flying around at the speed of light that'll blast your circuit, you know, and all kinds of stuff. So I'm digging into it and um, it and I go, I, it seems like we should build a 100K KRAD computer. I, was, I wasn't the team lead, there was another guy that they hired. Now, what is a hundred K rad to note? Just because I'm not like a radiation expert, like it's a lot of radiation. So, a hundred K rad, you can basically, if your if your uh, electronics can handle a hundred K rad, you can go to the moon. You could go on deep space missions. Oh, cool! It covers about ninety percent of NASA's requirements. So, just think of it as what are the other ten percent? What's that? I said, what are the other ten percent? Uh. So that's called rad hard. And there's actually an FPJ out there that my the microchip makes. And um, it is rad hard. It uses fuses. It, they blow fuses in the chip. And that's how they configure the FPJ. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so that's, you're just, you're, it's burned in forever if you do that. It, and if you screw up, you throw the chip away and it costs 40 grand. Yeah, you would have to. Jeez. <laughs> So um, yeah, we didn't use that one. We used the flash base they could reprogram. So so anyway, I said okay, 
man, let's put 100K rad in the spec. My, my team lead said, oh, yeah, that'll be fine. We're just going to be in LEO, uh, low Earth orbit, and um, that should be fine for that. <clears throat> and then um, NASA assigned some NASA engineers to our program as consultants, and they said, how come you're 100K rad? You only need 30. <laughs> well, I already designed the computer. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> A is not going to hurt. Yeah. So anyway, um, <clears throat> so it's a 100K rad computer. It, the computer is not going to be the thing that fails. Um, there's a there's a very interesting uh, history on this radiation effects. Did you know that NASA has found that some blue screen of death problems with PCs were caused by cosmic particles? Wait. Uh, here on Earth. How Really? Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at www.ska.solutions. There was actually an incident with an airliner, and it dropped 4,000... 96 feet. That's a magic number. It is a power 4, of two. 96. One of the high order bits got flipped by a radiation and and it dove. It, it went like at a 45 degree angle. People flew out of their seats and they're and they they got it on the ground and they're testing all the, the electronics. They can't find it. Can't find it anywhere. They re, you know, reboot the thing and it cleared it. And and they finally figured out it was one of these particles hit hit the memory inside and, and flipped um, that one bit. That's wild. So that's uh, 4096 is, uh, let's see. So um, 256 is 8 bits. 512, 9, 10 is 1,000. So it's going to be like the 12th bit. Yeah, so the 12th bit flipped in memory and caused the plane to dive 4,000 feet. That's wild. So this stuff is real. Now, if you think it's So it's that's bad, what, like the autopilot was Earth. tracking where the altitude was supposed to be. Like it must have been, right? Like your target. Because it's not going to freak out your sensor. So, yeah. That's... Well, I think it was in the sensor code. Yeah, but it's, it's, it has, to, it has to have been the set point, though, right, for the control algorithm uh, that, that got flipped. Like, it, it probably forgot where its set point was. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. that's true. It's, you're right. It's probably the, the set point. But, um, yeah, so so th these are real stories. that it And the atmosphere attenuates 90-plus percent and 99 percent of these things from hitting the Earth. So you can imagine... You know that space is you know a hundred or several hundred times more of a problem. This radiation and particles flying around in space to design avionics, you know, electronics for up there. And um, so, so we designed to use all hundred K rad components, and um, it's really a really robust computer. That's awesome. So then you did, that, um, you did that in eight months. You were able to design that, or uh, I went from concept to first PC board in about it was about eight months. That's wild. Yeah, it was about eight months. How and many layers of, of board? On it. Hmm? How many layers of board, if I can ask? Uh, that one wasn't too bad. I think I did that in uh, six layers. Nice. No, no, I'm sorry. Eight layers. Eight layers. Yeah. Um, the board I'm working on now is 10 layers, but it I'm putting a computer that's more powerful than the Arcanaut computer. The Arcanaut computer was on a printed circuit board. Um, so in space, they call them U, U's, like 1U, 2U, 3U. 1U means it's 100 millimeters on a side, which is basically four inches. Yeah. And um, that's where your CubeSats. So that's the the, the physical. That's how big those are. Is they're, they're 100 sat. millimeter cube. Yes. And then if you have so a that's three, called a one U. And then if you have a two U, that's like two of those smashed together, right? Is my understanding. Right. 
Okay. So, um, so this is actually a three U board. Um, the the board that I'm working on right now, and I just finished um, this afternoon, about an hour before our our um, podcast here. It's I'm putting as much circuitry as I put on the Arcanet one <laughs> in a, a four inch square board, you know, hundred awesome. hundred millimeter on a side, and then you can stack the boards. <clears throat> And um, so there'll be a CPU board, and then you'll have daughter cards that stack vertically, and you can build up CubeSats. Um, <clears throat> I also was uh, the principal investigator on a NASA SBIR last year, where NASA wanted um, a, a tiny company that I work for, and uh, they wanted us to talk to everyone in the space business and find out what kind of avionics they need, you know, how, how many K rads they need, um, cost and all this other, all these other things. And while I was doing that, I uh, did a web search on um, satellite failures. And I, I ran across this article that was came out in 2016. And it was by NASA. And between 2011 and 2015, 42.6% of CubeSats and SmallSats failed. They didn't complete their mission. And I went, holy cow, you know, I've been, because I, I earn the side of making something robust. I want to build a computer that never hiccups. You don't want to be on the wrong side of that 42.6%. Right. Yeah. I would shoot myself if my stuff had that failure rate. I would say <laughs> I need to do, I need to do something else. <laughs> um, and the CubeSat people, because they don't have a, a lot of money, the the FPJ, a space rated FPJ is forty to fifty thousand dollars for a single chip. Now you have other space rated chips around it, so you're going to spend. You know, one hundred twenty thousand on just on chips to start with. The CubeSat people don't want to spend over fifty, so they go to DigiKey and buy parts, and they just pray, and they send it up. Oh, that's interesting. And I talked to a CubeSat, uh, someone that, that built a CubeSat um, recently, and they said, "Yeah, it lasted two weeks up there." <laughs> Brutal. Um, yeah. So anyway, we did a we did a survey of what people wanted, and um, we didn't get a phase two. So I went looking for work, and I found this this great job at Next Stage, and we're we're designing what I consider is the ultimate off the shelf computer for the space business because you could use it in a CubeSat. It's also networkable. Oh, cool. So you could use it in a small sat and maybe it, it, a small sat is a larger one. You know, it might be that as big as a refrigerator. Gotcha. A refrigerator, for example. Um, but that's a small sat. Um, so you can put these in in, in, um, in a small sat or just a, a regular spacecraft and you can network them together. And I am um, I'm also inventing my own network. Um, FPJs have a super high speed serial line um, pins coming out of it that can go like 12, um, 12 gigabits per second. Nice. It's, it's insane how fast they are, which means you have to use RF connectors, <laughs> but you don't need to go that fast in a network. Um, the microchip FPJ can go down, can actually throttle down the CERTES down to 250 megahertz, which is fine for, high level commands running around the spacecraft. So I've designed um, a two wire network instead of, you know, uh, ethernet is, is like eight wires, right? It is, um, but you can, you can get it down to two, like two wire ethernet seems to be popular in automotive and some commercial industrial applications. Now you can get it down to two wire. I was uh, talking to Lockheed Martin on a zoom call one time and they really wanted a two wire solution. And they were talking about, you know, using a FI, which is, you know, um, <clears throat> is like, you know, TCIP um, type protocol stuff. But 
there's a there's a protocol that was around during the 90s is called arcnet and in aerospace and um, it's used in commercial aircraft and <clears throat> military and they call it um a rink and it's basically arcnet and what arcnet does is it, it all the computers are daisy chained together so you know <clears throat> and then each packet has a header that says what cpu is going to and if a cpu gets it it's not to them it just forwards it on so you can go down to two two wires very easily using an arcnet do you get a cascading uh, failure though if like one of them gets knocked out and can't forward it on yeah um well when you, when you look at um ethernet Ethernet works well up to about 60% <clears throat> bandwidth if you have mul if you have multiple computers and then you start getting collisions. Oh, that's interesting. And during the 90s when when people were were pushing um, Ethernet, I said, oh, "I really don't like that cuz you got, you know, you have to you have to detect the collision and then you have to do something about it. You have to retransmit and do all this complexity. Which you can't Whereas do. ArcNet with... is like a is like a train. You know, it's just the cars are just going along. The data is just going along the, the wires, and it's really robust. <clears throat> and it in the early nineties, it was as fast as uh, Ethernet. Now, of course, Ethernet went to more more wires. They're up to you know um, eight pairs now, and um, so Ethernet is faster. But ArcNet is more reliable, and I always go for reliability. <clears throat> but I don't need a phi. I can I can hook directly up to the FPJ pin. You don't need an external chip. FPJs have a very high speed serial interface that can go up to twelve um, gigabits per second, called SERDES, and it's basically you know it's a serial uh, data link. Um, and it uses, um, you know, plus and minus voltages like, like LBDS. <clears throat> and if you, if you, um, have a data signal that's using the bipolar, um, voltages, if, if noise hits the wire, then, that, then it raises the voltage on both wires and, and basically it doesn't see it because it's looking at the difference between the two. Which is unaffected. Wires. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, it's a very robust. And so I'm designing uh, kind of an ArcNet style uh, network to network my my computer boards together. The user will just be caught, you know, they'll have a device driver that they just said, you know, send out this data, you know, build this packet, send it out and you're done. You know, so the C programmers won't know the hardware. It'll just work. Awesome. But... <clears throat> Um, in space, um, you know, ounces matter. It. I just looked this up the other day to put a CubeSat in orbit of one uh, one U, which is you know four inch square cube. It's one hundred seventy five thousand dollars today, and a, a two a two U um, unit, which is double the size, is two hundred seventy five thousand. So. <clears throat> You know, size and weight matters a lot in space until Elon gets Starship going. <laughs> <laughs> All bets are off when 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 he gets Starship going. That's revolutionary. Uh, we'll be living in space and having lunch up there. <laughs> Sounds like fun. So getting back to the board I'm designing back here because yeah. I'm doing the same thing with this board. Um, what I want to ultimately design is this board where it's like it's the Star Trek computer. You talk to it in English. The C was invented back in 1963 uh, <clears throat> at the AT&T, uh, you know, labs. And about three years before, a fellow named Charles Moore was working at the Kitt Peak Telescope in Arizona, and he was writing code in assembler language. And he started writing basically what's what we call today as structured programming, which means you 
you call routines. You don't jump. The program doesn't jump around. It calls routines. <clears throat> and um, software is a lot easier to debug when you call a routine than if you jump from one place to another, like go-tos and basic. Yeah, go-tos suck. I mean, <clears throat> yeah. So he actually created a language back in 1960 called Forth, F-O-R-T-H. He was going to call it F-O-R-U-T-H, but the mini computer he's programming on could only take five characters for a file name. <laughs> so he dropped the U and he called it Forth. <clears throat> Forth is a very interesting language. Um, I had a whole series of robots, robotics and uh, that I sold. I sold over 2,000 of them. And they were all based on the fourth language. What fourth is, is interactive. So, you know, um, in the C world, if you want interactive, use Java. If you want compiled, use C. If you want object oriented, use C. And then there's all kinds of other derivatives. In fourth, you can do everything, all of those things. And it runs on an 8 bit micro just fine with very little memory. That's interesting. So it, <clears throat> hmm? I said, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, up until about 1990, Forth was actually the king of embedded systems <clears throat> because you just didn't have enough memory to run C. You didn't have enough CPU power. Then during the 1990s, you know, when the PC really started taking off, um, you know, schools between AT&T and, and, you know, the schools were teaching C. And fourth was in, wasn't invented by a computer science guy. <laughs> it was invented by a programmer, you know, who basically taught himself how to program. So fourth <clears throat> was kind of pushed aside. But the thing about fourth is you don't create functions, you create words. And it's just like using a chat box. It's a, it, identical to using a chat box. <clears throat> so you create all these words, and each word is a function of your program. You can incrementally compile. You compile one word, and and you send that word to the fourth computer. It, it, it gets interpreted and incrementally compiled, and now that new word is part of the vocabulary the computer knows. And it does it in a... In, a fraction of a second. Whereas with C, you edit all the source code and you have to compile it and you have to create a binary blob. And then you have to JTAG the processor that takes, it take, you know, five, 10 seconds or minutes, depending how big it is. And if you change one line of code, you got to go through that whole process again. With fourth, you don't do that. <clears throat> Once you have a fourth engine, you just send the, the source code down and it, it gets parsed and compiled. <clears throat> I find it fascinating, and, and fourth is considered an obscure language today, although this is based on a fourth processor. Oh, cool. Be, and the fourth press processor is inside the chip, including the interpreter and the compiler. So you, you basically have two lines, transmit and receive from a serial port, and you can talk to that computer and use another computer that has a terminal running on it. Or this also has a display that you can plug into it and a keyboard, and you don't have to use it, any other computer to program it. Nice. Unlike, um, you know, C. So where I was getting at with Star Trek is ultimately... I want to build a Star Trek computer that you just talk to it. So in the beginning with this guy, you will type to it. <laughs> and then later on, we'll add a speech to text conversion, which you can buy boards that do that today. And then you could literally talk to the thing and program it using your voice. Very cool. The, one of the disadvantages of fourth is it, the reason it's so, um, compact like you can compile a force system in as little as 4k of <clears throat> you know binary and then you you jtag a processor and now it's running forth a cool. full force system is about 12k 
And then from there on, you don't use any of your uh, your normal tools and you just do everything in fourth and through a terminal program. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is why are computer languages so primitive? Why can't, remember I, I talked to you earlier about the processor and you can add your own opcode like a SHA-256 function. Yeah. And it's an opcode. Using the so FPGA. It's in the FPGA and it's it's a fourth word. You can interactively, you know, uh, execute it using this guy. Um, so what I want to do is um, I want to build that Star Trek style computer using this and build on top of fourth. Wait, one of the ways that fourth gets its efficiency is it use there's a stack in every CPU and C uses the stack. So when you have a local variable um, in C that you define within the function, that's, that's a local variable, it uses the stack. It puts that data on the stack um, <clears throat> when it enters the function and then you process. And then when you exit the function, it clears the data off the stack. Fourth explicitly uses the stack. So if I say one space two space plus space dot, which is print. So you, you give forth the data first and then the action, right? So it's That's not awesome. infix notation. It's, it's um, reverse Polish notation. <clears throat> I'm going to build on this a high level language that's going to make it a lot easier and make the code a lot easier to read. Fourth code can be a little challenging to read. You, you'll see swap, drop, you know, nip, tuck. You know, what is that, right? So it's another reason why fourth kind of lost favor. But I've implemented a 32-bit fourth on this guy with only 2,600 logic units. They're called LUTs on an FPGA. <clears throat> The basic FPJ on here is 25,000 LUTs. So I could fit, you know, dozens of 32 bit fourth computers on there if I wanted to, but that's not the optimal way to, to use it. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so FPGAs, let's talk about them for a minute. They're massively parallel machines. Um, so you, you get the manufacturer's tools, the tool set, like in the case of microchip, it's called Libero. And you can code, it looks like code, you know, it looks like executable code to you, but it's not. It What it does is when it compiles and then synthesizes in the chip, it's creating a circuit that's running your algorithm that you're describing in, in code. And system bear log looks just like C. So C people that know C can pick up system bear log pretty quickly. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing about, about FPJs is um, they have what they call modules. And each module is a separate little computer on the chip. You could have a thousand of them on the chip running in parallel at the same time all running at 250 megahertz. Now That's do awesome. the math on that. Gigahertz my butt. <laughs> <laughs> That's terror. That's terahertz, you know? <laughs> so, um, so FPJs were always very expensive. They were hard to use. Um, one of the other things about this, when I get it all working, it's not working yet today. So don't call me and say, I want to buy one of these. Um, I'll take two. Be, yeah, it's going to be a few months. Um, I will contact you when they're ready. Yeah, absolutely. But with this, you're going to be able to really get into FPJs a lot easier and faster because you're only making a, one opcode. You're changing one thing in the, in the source code. You get the full source code, by the way. It's open source of the core one system. <clears throat> And uh, what I'm hoping is we create a community and people are generating their own opcodes and sharing them with other people. So you can you can pick all these opcodes that you want to do your application, put them in there, synthesize um, the chip, downloading your FPJ, and now you have a computer 
that that has all these new words in it. <clears throat> and I will tell you that um, source level debugging in C is really a pain versus like just interactively typing a word and feeding it parameters and press enter and it executes. And so then you can go and um, look at your, your variables and see how they changed. You could write little test words really simply and easily. And fourth, um, do you ever have to get rid of like old words? Like if you write a bunch of test words, does that clutter things up? Can you just delete explicitly stuff that's kind of cluttering up your, your memory as it were? Yeah, so uh, there's actually two ways to do that. So you can, in fourth, you can forget. So you can forget, you, you tell it the name of the word you want to forget to. Let's say you, you've defined 10 words. Uh, let's say you put a stub word in there, you just call it, um, you know, end or something like that. And, um, or test, call it test. And then you define all these test words and you say, forget, forget test. It'll forget all the words that were defined plus the word test. And, and that gets rid of your test words. Another way is, which you can't do this and see, is called a deferred word. You can actually go into the compiled code and change it. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> it with fourth, yes. You can decompile a word, we call it C S E E. If you say C in the name of the word, it decompiles it and shows you how it's coded. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and you could you could actually replace um, you could replace a function inside of your code by making a de deferred word. So let's just say that you uh, you know that there's a there's a word that's going to be on your low, lower level list, and all these words are built on top of it and you know you want to change that word down here so what you do is you make what's called a deferred word because fourth everything is a pointer to fourth it's just their pointers in c are like maddening right um and fourth is everything's a pointer and it's so simple you know it's just a memory location you just it's a number you just fetch and store data at that memory location and the story you don't go through all of these asterisks and ampersands and all this other crap, you know, to get at a memory location like you do in C. And I'm a C programmer, by the way, guys. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not belittling, belittling C. I use C. I know you're talking a lot of smack on pointers. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so what you do is the way that fourth compiles is it looks in the dictionary at the address of where the word is defined. So Basically, the dictionary is a link list. Um, there's some other more advanced ways of doing it, but think of it like a link list. Sure. So the word is defined, and then the memory lo location after that is the compiled, is the addresses of the words that it calls, or it's literals that are um, compiled in. You know, your literals are your numbers, right? Yeah. And then um, when you <clears throat> when it hits semicolon, so um, it terminates and it's all compiled. So what you can do is you can you can create a, a word that is just a memory address and you can take the it's called the code field address. It's the address of the word that you want to work on and you put it in there and then you you create the word that um, that you would normally um, use. You know, let's just say as update screen or something like that. Um, what update screen does, it goes and grabs the, the memory address of the word that you're working on and executes it. Real simple. But now what you can do is you can keep defining new versions of it, and then you store the new address that it got compiled at in that memory variable. And then so it's like an alias. Execute it. Huh? It's kind of like an alias. It's like uh, like the thing that you call where you can have it point different places depending on what you're trying to get it to do. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you can change the address and and use the more, the more current, um, <clears throat> you know, version. And then it will be updated everywhere that called the. Um, I can't yep. remember what the name for it was, but that's yeah. right. So all the words that are built on top of it are calling that that new word. So, 
let me show you where, where, where this is really important. And I've asked, I'm in the space business. I've asked a couple dozen space people. You have a hundred robots out in Pluto that are doing some mining or something or something or other, and you need to update the software. Your data link is 750 bytes per second. Are you going to send up a C compiled binary blob of <laughs> seven, 750 bytes per second? It'll take days for it to get up there. And you have 100 robots to update. With, with this and using the fourth um, method, you would send up like the, the, the source code of the, of the function that you want to replace. And maybe it's 160 bytes. And it would go up there in a fraction of a second. And it would compile while the spacecraft is running. And then in one clock cycle, it will switch to the new code. Oh, cool. So I have asked all my space friends that program, I get a blank stare or a laugh. I've never had anyone explain to me how you do it. Well, one way to do it is <clears throat> you put Linux up there. <laughs> You have Linux and all the your compiler tools and everything else, which remember how expensive space rated hardware was. Yep. So if you're going to run Linux, you know, you need a 32 bit RISC five or 64 bit RISC five, and you, you need all this memory and it's going to cost you, you know, a half a million dollars for the computer components. And, you know, then you could send up source code and have it compiled, but you still are going to be JTAG in that processor. And that, that spacecraft during the JTAG process is going to be not controlled, uncontrolled. Yeah, completely. It will start, you know, rotating in space until it, it wakes up and then it's going to have to realign itself. With a fourth base system, you don't miss a beat. It, one clock cycle, it changes out the code. Now, I guess as we're kind of nearing the end, is there anything you want to plug on the way out that you just want to leave people with or you know, an ad for something you're doing? Um, just uh, the, the core one. I think it's going to be revolutionary. You can get your hands on the latest technology, playing around with FPJs, intelligent machines. <clears throat> we're going to be putting um, the 7 billion parameter uh, llama um, data set on the board, it'll just fit in the, in the flash memory I have on there. So the machine will be able to, to be able to utilize that. Um, I'm all about AI. So that's where we're going. We'll, we'll have a podcast when I have something to show you. Yeah, I, I would like that. I the core one actually is working today. The, the interpreter and the compiler work. Awesome. In the core system. I'm, I'm definitely excited to see it live. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to the next one. It's been fun. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at www.ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you.